Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 57 of the Ask Historians podcast, a listener-supported podcast. Today's topic is the Holocaust, and more specifically, we're going to be talking about an academic debate over the causes and the reasons and the rationale and the development of the Holocaust. More on that in just a second, but I just want to go ahead and give a big thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon uh, and let you know what we are going to be doing with the kind of excess money that's coming in right now. So right now we have a, a small bonus above our basic operating costs and keeping uh, our, our Libsyn and our SoundCloud account up. Uh, and you know, I've almost got all the back episodes on SoundCloud. I promise I'll have those up soon. But uh, we have a small surplus above that. And the, the plan now is to basically kind of take that and put it aside uh, until we have enough to, at one point, uh, buy a academic history text. Um, probably on the cheap, probably get something, you know, lightly used uh, and raffle that off to our uh, contributing members. So if you are a contributor to the Ask Historians Patreon, um, you can foresee in at this at the rate we are right now, uh, in, a, in a few months, uh, you will perhaps be the recipient of a free academic textbook. We'll probably give you a couple choices uh, of what you can get there. But uh, So we're going to try to do that, kind of get it in on the cheap and see what we can find and, and get and see our choices there. But uh, that's the plan now. Uh, and as we uh, build more uh, subscribers and have more people support the podcast, uh, we would get that out uh, more and more frequently until we get to a point where we're doing about one a month, at which point we'll, I guess, we'll have to start thinking of more impressive things to do with our money, uh, perhaps contributing it towards a, a fund to getting people to the AHAs. Um, but anyway, for right now, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who supports us on the Patreon, which is, of course, uh, patreon.com forward slash askhistorians. Yeah, go there now. I'll wait. Uh, or you can just hit pause and come back. I'm not actually going to wait. Moving on back to our topic at hand, which is slightly light, slightly less lighthearted, uh, the Holocaust. And specifically, again, uh, there's this academic debate of intentionalism versus functionalism, uh, which our guests will explain much, much more in depth as we get on. But I want you to kind of approach it and think about it as this, this debate between people in Germany after the end of World War II, people who, who lived through it or people whose parents lived through it, people who were still very much grappling with it as an immediate idea, trying to come to the idea, trying to come to, to grips with the, the question of why did this happen? And more importantly, who is responsible and who is culpable? Well, you know, what is the limits of human agency? Uh, so I, I want you to kind of approach that. Uh, I want you to approach this episode through that lens of kind of imagining yourself in that situation of someone in you know 1960s, 1970s, even 1980s Germany, uh, or you know just in, generally in the historical profession, looking at the Holocaust and saying, "Why did this happen? Is this something that was intrinsic to people, or, or is this unavoidable?" Which is, of course, a question that is, you know, very often a fundamental question of dealing with anything uh, when doing any sort of Holocaust studies. But I, I think this this kind of focusing on this one particular aspect of the debate helps kind of open it up. Uh, along the way, we, of course, talk about a lot of the aspects of the development of the Holocaust, like some of the earlier plans like uh, Action T4, uh, some of the later things like Operation Reinhardt, but also some of the some of the kind of like half even ad hoc measures, the ghettoization of the Jews, uh, forced deportations, uh, some of the laws that made it untenable for Jews to live in Germany, uh, even you know, crazy, crazy ideas like building a giant reservation for Jews in southern Poland or shipping all of the Jews in Europe to Madagascar. Uh, because sure, why not? That will work. We'll talk about all those things uh, in this episode of the podcast. Uh, and we have a, a, ter a terrific guest today, uh, an absolute wonderful speaker. And also uh, I've done a little bit something different with the, the audio. So hopefully it should be uh, probably one of the, the clearest, sharpest, uh, most orally pleasing of the podcast you've heard so far. So hope you enjoy. Welcome. Ask Historians Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians Podcast. Today I am here with Joe, although he goes by the slightly more whimsical name of Commie Space Invader on the Ask Historians subreddit. Uh, we are actually discussing a slightly less whimsical topic today, and that will be the Holocaust and really kind of looking at uh, some of the academic historical debate around it and some of the rationale that led to it. Uh, but before we get started, Joe, why don't you go ahead and let us know what got you in particular interested in this topic? Uh, first of all, hi, everyone. <laughs> um, as for my relation to the topic, it um, 
parts of my family were persecuted by the Nazis because of political reasons. And uh, basically, during my youth, I spent a lot of time in um, these Austrian left-wing youth groups like the Antifa and, 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 and similar stuff. And that really, that's really what got me interested in the topic. And, and I finally decided to go into it um, academically when uh, instead of my mandatory military service i did a year abroad in in a major institution related to the holocaust i worked there for a year um and that's what really got me into the topic and and kind of sealed the deal for me to go academically into history and into nazi history yeah and i guess we should mention that that you yourself are austrian correct so it's exactly yeah so it's it's somewhat all kind of all around you i guess you should say <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that is uh, quite the correct assessment. Yeah, so one of the ways that we're going to be looking about uh, looking at this topic and kind of talking about it is is through this kind of uh, academic theoretical framework of this kind of debate that went on about functionalism versus intentionalism in the Holocaust. So could you give us uh, the us the the listeners and those of us who are not familiar with this topic uh, kind of a rundown about what what is this debate? This debate is basically one of the central debates of the last um, 30 years uh, in Holocaust studies. Um, it is not really, like today you wouldn't divide so much anymore as you did back in the day, but the basic question it revolves around is um, why did the Nazis perpetrate the Holocaust? And, and how did the Nazi regime function as a regime? You have on, on the one side, you have the intentionalists that explain the Holocaust and the course of Nazi, Nazi Germany in terms of um, Hitler's personal intentions, um, who, which are derived from a coherent and consistent ideology and implemented through a totalitarian dictatorship. And on the other hand, you have the functionalists who emphasize the anarchical nature of the Nazi state and um, the chaotic decision-making process surrounding the Holocaust that is speckled with uh, constant um, improvisation and as a very important buzzword there, their theory of cumulative radicalization, basically building on top of each previously anti-Jewish policies, the Nazis at some point through um, initiatives from the periphery arrive at murder. So to kind of put this into the most simplistic terms we could, it's a debate over whether the Holocaust was something that Hitler had planned from the very beginning and it was carried out because Hitler wanted it to happen from the very beginning or versus it was something that more kind of grew organically from uh, kind of the, as you could say, the, the collective radicalization of the Nazi state. Exactly. Like uh, if you take, for example, one of the most extreme positions in these debates, you have on the one hand people like Lucy Davidovitz, who in her, in her book um, writes that Hitler had the idea to kill all the Jews of Europe in 1922. And from there on, he pursued a straight road in terms of his politics towards that aim and, and never deviated from it. And, only de and if he deviated from it for a short time, only did so because of strategic um, considerations. And on the other hand, you have people like Hans Mommsen who, and Martin Brojat who, who basically say that um, Hitler didn't even decide that the Holocaust was going to happen. It just happened. No, one question I had about the intentionalist school that when I was doing some of my background reading for this was that is it to be a, you know, a true intentionalist, I guess you could say, but you know, to keep with the purity of the theoretical idea, would this only be the result of Hitler? Or, you know, could we expand, expand this out to also encompass you know, very high-ranking Nazi officials? Well, um, it, 
in a sort of way, it would encompass high-ranking officials, but it all really goes back to, to, to Hitler and his role. Because there, it's, it's it rather essential to, to their idea of Nazi Germany that it is a totalitarian state, meaning there is a center which is deciding everything. So Hitler is the decider. Um, he, he, he's the one who formulates central theory and everybody else is basically his henchmen or his, or are his willing executioners in that matter. Um, yeah. So, so in a way that it, there could have been a very high ranking Nazi official who from, you know, even in the 1920s, uh, had desired to, uh, commit the, the mass genocide of the Jewish people. But the fact that, you know, by the time you actually had the 1933 elections and the election of Hitler, uh, that wouldn't have happened had Hitler not wanted it to happen, uh, regardless of what people around him had desired. You know, that it, it ultimately uh, things happened because Hitler wanted to happen and they didn't happen because Hitler did not want them to happen in a way. Exactly. Exactly. Like um, they, they, for example, would use the example of Heinrich Himmler um, being very pushy in his policies um, towards uh, a more radical and more brutal policy and Hitler reining him in at certain times because of strategic considerations. Now, part of this debate is also the fact that the, you know, the final solution, quote unquote, uh, that, that led to uh, the, what we call the Holocaust or the pojama or, you know, basically the, the mass uh, genocide of various peoples, including the Jews, gypsies, other people in, in Europe as well, the, the one of the key aspects of this debate, I take it, is that there were kind of intermediate steps that this the Holocaust did not start immediately after the, the Nazis came to power, which is not to say that things were great for people who were not, <laughs> you know, your traditional Aryan Jews in Germany at the time. But, you know, there were some kind of intermediate steps, right? Exactly. Like, I want to make something clear here from the beginning like when i in this for the purpose of the episode talk about the holocaust what i'm or the final solution as we understand it today i want to i'm talking about the state-driven systematic murder of jews and roma and sinti um as it started in 1941 um this is a very narrow definition because other institutions will broaden that um, that topic and, for example, include um, the euthanasia killings and include the, 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 the killings of the Russian POWs. But for the purpose of this episode, I want to stay with this very narrow definition because it serves us better for discussing the um, intentionalist-functionalist debate. And uh, speaking of the process that kind of led up to it, we see um, we see it as not one event that is occurring, but as a certain progression of of, of policies. And these start basically in the 1930s with the Nazis, who have this um, central idea of we need to get rid of the Jews because the Jews are a threat. Yeah. And now, for when that you say get rid of, and I know this is the question that we're going to keep coming back to, but when you say get rid of the Jews, what was what what did that mean back in 1933? Well, in the first place, it meant, um, in a, in a very broad sense, that we need to get them to leave Germany. The first steps they take is basically getting rid of the Jews from, from bureaucratic and important political positions. So they fire all the Jews in who are state employees in 1933, for example. And, and then they move on to defining who is a Jew. Because Nazi racial policy is pseudoscience, and therefore there is no way to determine who is Jewish by measuring their cranium. So basically, they need a working working definition that works in legal sense. And they make that up with the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, where they say, well, you are a Jew, either if you practice the Jewish religion, or if uh, three of your grandparents are Jewish, then you're a Jew. And um, from there on, from this working definition, they move on to a policy of um, expropriation and forced emigration. So basically, they use this definition first to 
take money and possessions away from the Jewish citizens of, of Germany and setting up a whole system that um, basically forces them to emigrate to other countries. Like when they talk about getting rid of Jews in the 1930s, they mean forcing them out of Germany. Yeah, so sort of a just make them not our problem any, anymore. Exactly. Um, kind of you know, expel them from this, you know, th this pure German society. Um, and, and it seemed like that was fairly effective, I guess you could say, because I was looking at some of the numbers, um, you know, prior of, of German Jews prior to, of course, World War II. And it seems like there was a, a huge flight of, of Jewish people, those who could, uh, from Germany. Uh, although, ironically, a lot of those two uh, countries and areas surrounding Germany that would later be occupied. Exactly. I mean, um, and in the beginning of or when the Nazis take over power in Germany, there are about half a million Jews in the country, which is more or less 1% of the total population. And up until they, the, the point in time when the Nazis um, outlaw Jewish emigration from Germany and from the, the occupied territories in 1941, there is about um, 247,000 Jews having, having emigrated from Germany. So, exactly, exactly. Which also, in, I mean, as you said, some of them or many of them go to countries like Belgium, France, the Netherlands, which, as later turned out, was not the best choice. Um, but But this also explains why the number of victims among German Jews are fairly lower on a comparative percentage than, for example, in the Soviet Union. Because the German Jews were subjected to Nazi rule the longest, but also had the most time to get away from the Nazis. Now, also, uh, I would assume many of these Jews also found themselves uh, in neighboring Poland as well, which had historically in Europe had probably one of the largest Jewish uh, populations. I think it was over three million um, right before World War II. Um, and of course, that seems like it became a bit of a problem when uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the Nazi, Nazi Germany decided to divide up Poland. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the start of the war changes everything, basically, because um, you could say that the war makes the final solution, whatever that is at that point in time, an issue of territory. First of all, with the start of the war, you have the massive problem that emigration is just not possible anymore in the numbers it was before, just because countries are closing up to German citizens, there are no more visas, and so on and so forth. And suddenly you find yourself in control of about 3 million Jews. And therefore, the Nazis started to develop new plans that for focus sort of more on a direct territorial aspect. And those two plans are, are or the, the plan at that point in time is, um, we're making a reservation for the Jews somewhere in our um, controlled space where where basically we put them and they stay there and we 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 prevent them from getting out and until we can we can achieve this um, we're concentrating them so that later on it will be easier to bring them to this uh, reservation we're planning yeah, so this and, is the this is the origin of the the ghettos, right? Exactly, exactly. It, it seems like, and I, this will probably be another theme that we come back to. It seems like this was not very well thought out in advance, uh, in, in the fact that if the the intention originally by the Nazis was to expel all of the Jews from Germany, in other words, we don't care where you go, we don't care how you go, just get out, uh, and therefore we'll have a pure Germany. It, it seems like if you're going to then start increasing what is considered Germany and, you know, and by, you know, taking large swaths of <laughs> Poland and uh, uh, taking parts of Czechoslovakia and uh, doing the, uh, the Anschluss with, uh, with Austria, it seems like you're, at least if you're a, a Nazi who's trying to get rid of all the Jews in Germany, it, it seems like you're creating more problems with yourself. Oh, well, some of the policy ideas clash because when we define the ideology of Nazism, the two central themes we see are race and space. 
So on the one hand, making Nazi Germany racially pure. And on the other hand, expanding our Lebensraum into the territory that is historically, I'm using air quotes here, um, historically ours, which is Eastern Europe. So these two ideas sort of clash. And you can see it in the plans they draw up. I mean, the first reservation plan for Jews is Eichmann in, in Vienna takes Jews from Prague and Vienna, puts them on a train and sends them to the town of Nisko at the border area between Soviet Poland and Nazi German Poland. And they basically just dump them there. And, and there is no further camp, no ghetto, no nothing. They just shove them out of the train and leave them there. And, and what do these people do? Like, the first thing they do is walk to the next train station, get on the next train and drive back to Vienna. So <laughs> it, it, was, it was kind of like, yeah, we had this idea, but that didn't really work. And, and, and so they come up with these grand, grand resettlement plans that, you know, they're talking about, well, at the end of the war, we're going to send them passed beyond the Urals, but this this is taking too long because we're not quite ready to attack the Soviet Union yet. So what do we do? And 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 after they defeat France in in June of 1940, um, the people in the Foreign Office of Germany go back basically to a very old idea from the 19th century that you know some Völkisch theoreticians in the 19th century said also said we need to get rid of the Jews and so what do we do? Well, we best send them to Madagascar because Madagascar is like this uninhabitable island off the coast of Africa. It's only populated by people we don't care about anyway, and population density is rather low. So Rademacher of the Foreign Office takes this idea and says, well, now that we've defeated France, we technically um, are the masters over their colonies. So technically, Madagascar is ours. So we can finally realize this plan of getting rid of the Jews in all of Europe by sending them to Madagascar. Now, so this seems a little, you know, in, in retrospect, this seems ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, you know, not only because the large forced migration to Madagascar, which, I mean, it's it's a large island, but... Uh, the, the population of Madagascar at the time was something like, you know, not much more than 4 million. So we're talking about more than doubling the population of this island uh, through forced uh, immigration to people who have no connections, no roots, uh, probably no idea of, you know, how to, even if you were assuming that, oh yeah, we'll go there or there and they'll set up farms or something like that. Uh, they have no idea of the soil or whatever. They'd probably be scared by lemurs. Uh, it, it seems it's, it's an alien world and Yet, apparently, this was being floated as a serious suggestion? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Foreign Office thought it a serious suge suggestion, and the SS actually also did so, because what they do is they took over from the Foreign Office. Like, they said, well, that's a great idea, and it's not ours. The, the, the thinking, they come up with this plan that they will turn Madagascar into basically what is a huge open-air concentration camp. Like the SS is saying, you know, what do we know how to do? And that is how to run a camp society. So why don't we take our expertise in, in this matter and, you know, multiply it by 11 million people? Uh, so when we have the shipping capacity to send all the Jews to Madagascar, we're going to basically establish an, an, S, an SS state there that is run by our people where we put a huge fence around the island and post guard posts there. And, and they just, you know, watch the Jews work themselves to death there. I mean, it's important to note here that the time they come up with this plan, it, it does include the possibility of mass death by starving, by disease, by, 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 you know, brutality from the SS guards who will eventually guard this island. Because an important shift has taken place at that, at that point in time, which is the Nazi regime is using murder by indifference or straight up murder as a political um, means to an end by that time, which they didn't do in the 19, in the 1930s so much. But by that time, they dream up Madagascar. They have the T4 euthanasia program running for a year. 
now, and the, there, the T4 th- euthanasia program is what? Um, it's basically the in 1939 the Nazis started killing disabled people. And the program, like they run a centralized program that from all the homes for disabled people in Germany, they would basically deport these people to six central killing facilities um, where these people would be murdered by the doctors uh, who cared for or who were employed by these facilities. And um, so Germany would get rid of what they call the... the, um, non-useful uh the non-useful people so they are using murder as a means as a policy means by that point in time and that influences how they think about the jewish question too which is they they are willing to accept mass death in the course of their solution so in a way this is kind of uh, an escalation from this idea of all these people that we don't want here will just go away if we make life hard enough for them to kind of transforming into a, okay, well, it looks like they're not going away, but at least we can contain them to kind of, well, containing them isn't working not too well. Maybe we could send them further away and then uh, kind of, but there's also this kind of parallel route of saying, well, you know, maybe we could just kill them because we're already doing with these people over here as well. But I, I want to go back to the, something you said about this kind of death by death by negligence in a way, it, because it, in, a, in a sense, isn't that, you know, if you're going to round people up and put them, you know, on an island off the coast of Africa or in a, you know, in an area in southern Poland and make no allowances for um, for them to live, isn't that in a way kind of a, a mass murder in and itself? And doesn't that kind of point to the idea that maybe there was an idea of of killing all the Jews kind of earlier than than what we would think when the Holocaust itself was developed? Yeah, I mean, at that point in time, you uh, you also have the ghettos running, um, which are in essence, a mini version of what they're planning in Madagascar. I mean, at that point in time, people are, in fact, starving and dying of tuberculosis in, in the Warsaw and, and, and Loblin and Wuch uh, ghettos. So um, by that point in time, I, 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 think, I think there is a qualitative difference between, you know, uh, we're going out to kill all these people by shooting them or gassing them, or, you know, we're going to kill these people by basically giving them no food uh, or allowing them, allowing them to starve. Like, I think, I think that is a, in, in as far qualitative difference as that um, the form or the, the, the idea of death by negligence is one that in general throughout the 20th century is one that was practiced more. And that points to a certain kind of like, um, more that is it, that it is discur- on a discursive level for them more possible to do that than the other thing. Like it is, it is not unthinkable. It is thinkable. You get what I'm what I mean, or am I? Yeah, I mean, I can absolutely see where, as opposed to simply saying wall these people off and let them starve to death, and therefore we are we themselves we ourselves are not committing murder we're just not allowing these people to live. <laughs> I mean, it's a very fine distinction, but I can see where you would say that, yeah, there's a qualitative difference there and that there's a little more of a historical precedent. Yeah, and I mean, we see, we see the qualitative difference really um, making an impact when we reach 1941. Because in 1941, some, another important discursive shift takes place, which is they're getting ready to attack the Soviet Union. And that means that the whole nature of the war is going to change. Because the war on the Soviet Union is not the war against France or against even the Balkan countries. Because the war against the Soviet Union, as explicitly stated, in a meeting in in, in March uh, 41 between Hitler and his generals, is going to be a war of ideological annihilation. And that means that contrary to previous policies where, you know, you have, for example, the Einsatzgruppen in Poland shooting people who are considered the Polish intelligentsia and therefore the core of resistance, 
or contrary to France, where they round people who they suspect of being uh, politically opposed to them, round them up and imprison them. In the Soviet Union, there is no imprisonment because with basically in Nazi thinking, with these people, there can be no compromise because they are the avant-garde of Judeo-Bolshevism in this world and they are set to destroy us and we need to destroy them. And therefore, um, you have the leadership of the Wehrmacht in conjecture with Hitler issuing the, the, the Commissar's Order and the so-called Kriegsgerichtsbarkeit Alas, which is that no soldier in the Soviet Union will be persecuted because of war crimes. And that is the basis for going uh, into the Soviet Union and immediately starting to round up every Bolshevik party member or party official and every male Jew and shooting them, like on the spot. Now, uh, underlying this, isn't there also the idea of this, uh, this Lebensraum, this idea that as you know, greater Germany expanded, it would need some place to expand to, and that place would be in the east, uh, which was complicated by the fact that there were already people in the east, but this would kind of solve that problem. Exactly. This would solve the problem. Then, I mean, they also had a plan drawn up for letting basically the major cities in, in Ukraine starve to clear the country of its people. But uh, the, the, the whole idea also with the, with the settlement of Lebensraum is that the Judeo-Bolsheviks, so, so the avant-garde of the, of, the, of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and every Soviet Jew they find they are, by their mere existence, a security threat. Like, when establishing the Lebensraum, these people are those people that will oppose us because of just the nature of their existence. Now, you had mentioned the, the Commissar Order, uh, and you had mentioned that there had been kind of a publication that had said, you know, you will not be persecuted for, for war crimes in, in, uh, in the East. But, I mean, was, was it directly in writing to say, round up the Jews, round up the Bolsheviks, and kill them immediately. Um, yeah. Basically, that was the, like, that was the order for uh, the Einsatzgruppen and the Wehrmacht, which is the all, all supporters of, or all Bolshevik officials, meaning every official in the party we come across and every male, in the beginning male Jew we come across needs to be shot. And like you see that they attacked the Soviet Union in 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 June of 1941, and I think by August 41, in Lithuania, of the previously um, like of the Lithuanian Jews, where there were previously 150,000 Jews in Lithuania, in August 41, merely a month after uh, two months after they 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 march in there, there are only three uh, 30,000 left. The rest has been shot. Now, was this seen as a, I don't want to say final solution at this point, but was this seen as a permanent solution? I mean, you know, was this seen as a, as a solution to the, to the quote unquote problem of, you know, Judeo Bolshevism and, and also just kind of the, the question of the Jewish people, you know, was it seen like, well, we'll do this, this will solve the problem and then we won't have to come up with anything else. Well, on a certain sense, yes. Like I think it's important to note here that um, with the Soviet Jews, there was all like there is always a difference between in in Nazi thinking between the Soviet Jews and the other European Jews, just because the Soviet Jews pose such a greater threat to the Nazis in their ideology, and therefore, therefore, for with them, there was never really the question of you know giving them a reservation or sending them to Madagascar, they were always the ones that basically from the, the point in time when the attack on the Soviet Union became a concrete plan, it was always very clear to all involved that the Soviet Jews had to die. So when does the idea to start applying this mass murder, um, I guess, policy... When does that, you know, policy of mass murder, when does that start becoming reflected back in other areas held by the Nazis this time? 
Well, we, we see an important shift in policy taking place first in the Soviet Union itself. Because around the time August and September uh, 41 comes around, the Einsatzgruppen start expanding their targets. Um, while up until August, uh, the Einsatzgruppen mainly targeted Jewish men. Around that time, they start killing women and children and then erasing whole communities. And around the same time, so in October 41, um, we see that change being reflected outside of the Soviet Union. First, you have in Serbia, the male, popul uh, the male Jewish population being killed as the preferred uh, Wehrmacht hostages for reprisal shootings. So basically, every time the, the Wehrmacht in Serbia was attacked by partisans, they would go out, take Jews as like take Jews as their hostages, and then then execute them. Which is the first time we see it outside of the Soviet Union that Jews are killed systematically because they are Jews, and for without having to prove some sort of connection to political opposition. And also we see that uh, sort of reflected in Poland, where in certain areas. Um, they're starting to be small-scale killing operations for certain districts. Like in, in Galicia, um, you have Christian Wirt, the former, one of the former euthanasia commanders, um, coming in and starting contru uh, construction for the first death camp in Belzec near, near Lublin. La later, Belzec was to become one of the Aktion Reinhardt camps, which is the killing of the Polish Jews, which in like in the month between between Fe between March uh, forty two and February thirty three, um, basically uh, I think it's about uh, three million Jews are killed, one point eight million of them in these Reinhardt camps, and they start construction on that in November, um, forty one. And also in the Wartegau, which is the annexed territories of Poland, there are sporadic killing actions in October and the start of the construction of the Chelmno camp, the camp designed to kill the Jews of the Wuch ghetto with the help of a gas van. So, so basically from October on, you see the policy of, of or you see that killing is becoming not only a possibility, but a reality in the Nazi policy in, in Eastern Europe. Now, was there a reason for this shift? I mean, is there something we can point to and say, you know, this is where it changed? Well, that would depend if you're an intentionalist or a functionalist, <laughs> which I think we'll get to, we'll get to, we'll get to in a minute. But, but um, I think like personally, I, I believe that um, it's, very important that they see that the Einsatzgruppen, the Einsatzgruppen um, method is working. So they see it's it's we can, you know, get rid of these large swaths of of, of Jewish population in one place, and that we solve a lot of problems when when we kill people. Like for example, and this also plays very often in these theories that what the Nazis have is a problem of keeping up rations, uh, food rations on the same level when they attacked the Soviet Union as they did before, like they're lacking food. And one of the, the side effects of the final solution in the Soviet Union is that they are noticing, well, you know, if we kill them, we don't have to feed them. Yeah, so I guess you could say that there were... <laughs> practical reasons for it um as cynical as it sounds but like like when we when i mean this is probably also something worth pointing out like i'm talking here about this all all very flippantly and and in a way that is probably to somebody not really acquainted with the subject matter sounds really awful i'm sure your accent doesn't help either uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that probably probably doesn't help either. You're you're absolutely right about that. But I just want to emphasize that that when I make all these points, 
there is a certain importance to that because we, in order to understand the historical phenomenon of Nazism and, and the Holocaust, we unfortunately have to understand the historical actors carrying it out in their mindset. Like, we have to get into that in order to, to get a clearer historical understanding of why they did what they did. And that unfortunately requires to a certain degree to get into um, these, this terrible way of thinking that, you know, oh yes, killing people saves us food. So it sounds horrible, but unfortunately it's part of studying this um, period in history that there is a certain need to get into the way they think. Now, I mean, how many people were thinking this, though? Who was making the decisions? And I guess, obviously, the, the, the soldiers who were carrying out these mass killings in Eastern Europe and the people who were running these kind of like proto-concentration death camps were, were aware of what was going on. But I mean, how widespread was knowledge of these mass killings? How widespread was that knowledge throughout both the, the Nazi uh, party officials and, and also kind of uh, in other nations in Europe and the world? Within the Nazi within the Nazi structure, you had above a certain level, you you knew about it. Even though later on in in January forty two, there is the Wannsee Conference, which is basically getting everybody together and discuss the logistics of 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 our new system of really killing everybody. Because this is what I got. Like what I didn't mention before is that we have this. Um, outbreak of killing in in october up until december and somewhere in december there must have been the final decision that you know we're not going to do this only in 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 eastern europe or in certain territories but we need to do this everywhere in europe and i'm saying december here because on december 8th um there is a massacre of German Jews sent to Lithuania or to Riga and uh, they are killed by the uh, local Nazi official in, in, in charge. And this Nazi official gets into trouble with Himmler because Himmler says, well, you were not supposed to have killed these German Jews because they were German. So we know that by December 8th, there was not yet the decision to kill everybody. Because everybody naturally would include the German Jews. But sorry, excuse me for going on that tangent. It's just a vital piece of, of information. As far as um, who knew about it, we of course have like the whole uh, Nazi state leadership above mid-level ministerial bureaucrat that knows about what's going on if they're in a ministry that has to do with these ongoings like the foreign ministry and also the economics ministry. And then, of course, like the biggest group that knows about it and that spreads this knowledge is every Wehrmacht soldier in the Soviet Union knows about it because they get the commissar order and they like logistically and, and with manpower support the Einsatzgruppen in their killing operations. So pretty much every Wehrmacht soldier in the Soviet Union, and that's a lot of people, knows about it. And basically also, in some cases, writes about it to home. So people in Germany start uh, comprehending that there is something going on in the Soviet Union that is concerning, you know, getting rid of the Jews. Now, you, you had mentioned the, the, Wannsee, uh, the Wannsee conference, just touching on it really quickly in, what you, in your comments there. But I, I believe that's really seen as the turning point from when this went from a sort of ad hoc, improvised uh, protocol of, of policy of, of killing, you know, mass killing into a kind of official state policy with a singular aim. Am I understanding the importance of Wannsee in, in this question then? Well, contrary to, to a sort of like popular misconception, Wannsee is not the place where the Nazi state, uh, state decides to kill every Jew in Europe. Rather, it is the meeting of all concerned parties who get together and talk, like who say, well, we now have this decision 
to kill every Jew in Europe, how are we going to do that? That is the first thing they, they talk about it. And the other thing they talk about it, and which takes up, you know, most of the time at the Wannsee conference, is they talk about how do we deal with the German half and quarter Jews? Like, do we include them in our program of, of murder? Or do we leave them alone for now? And on the second question, they never really come to a consensus. Like, they nev there's never a really clear policy towards the so-called Mischlinge, so the, basically the mixed people. Um, but on the first issue, like, how are we going to organize this logistically, they come to a consensus. And uh, their consensus is we're going to start combing through Europe from west to east and start deporting people to the camps and kill them there. And they basically assign the roles at this conference, like the, the propaganda ministry talks about what they need to do, and the foreign office uh, gets told that their um, responsibility is to pressure states like Vichy France and, and the Romanians and the Slovakians and the Bulgarians and the Italians to hand over their Jews to the Germans so that they can complete their final solution. I mean, they draw up very, uh, basically, very detailed plans and include um, the number of Jews they estimate to be in every country. Like, in the Wannsee Conference, they, they have Britain in there. Like, they have the Jews of Britain planned in for their little, or for their program of murder. Even They even mentioned the three Jews in Ireland that they want to kill. So by the time we reach Vansi, we essentially the decision to kill all the Jews has already been made. It's already official policy, but Vansi was kind of working out the details and the logistics. Exactly. And and the difficulty with with this decision is there is no written order for it. And it's really hard, because of the lack of this, it's really hard to date when exactly the decision to kill every Jew in Europe was taken. Because... With the, the Holocaust, the Nazis wanted to avoid the, same, the mistakes in their eyes, the mistakes they had made with the T4 program, where um, with the euthanasia program, there was an order signed by Hitler who put people in charge of this whole program. And what they felt was that this concrete, like this concrete responsibility of certain people really... Um, limited them in their in their realization of the program rather than than help them because the nature of the nazi state and this is even something intentionalists will also say that the nazi system is very polycratic in its nature meaning that there are several people working towards what they perceive as the fuhrer's goal and therefore this whole state is very dynamic in taking initiatives towards a rather not that very well-defined um, goal. And therefore, they felt that, you know, giving concrete responsibility to these people will alienate these other people, and therefore these other people will stop, uh, will stop cooperating with the assigned people and so on and so forth. So they decided against basically a central order that would spell out what the exact program was because it is very likely that they didn't know what the exact program was at that point in time. Yeah, but we do see, of course, I mean, <laughs> at the beginning and at, you know, at Vansi, we have, you know, these long lists of all the Jews in all the countries of Europe. Um, we have, uh, you know, policy already in place of, of mass, uh, mass murders in Eastern Europe. Um, and we do have, uh, after this, we, we also have Operation Reinhardt, correct? Which you mentioned earlier. Yeah, but Operation Reinhardt is a good example of why in the Nazi state it does not work very well to assign specific responsibilities or make specific plans. Reinhardt is, is a very good example of why the making of very concrete plans and adhering to it does not work well in the Nazi state. Because... In Wannsee, they talk about how they're going to clean Europe from west to east. So they're going to start in France uh, with the Jews of France and then start killing them and then go east um, to the so until they reach the Soviet Union where they don't have the problem anymore. 
But Reinhardt is a program that is specifically set up to kill the Polish Jews. Because, you know, when they start advancing uh, France and telling them, well, you know, uh, we'd like to deport all your Jews to Eastern Europe, uh, the, the French government in Exa or the French government in Vichy is saying, well, you can have the stateless Jews, but not the French Jews. And so they immediately start encountering problems with their plan Advance and then are forced to basically improvise and, and start with those Jews they have the most direct control over. And those are those in Poland. And this is how um, Operation, Operation Reinhardt is, is, is born. Now you had said that, and I, I want to go back to this, and I think this is kind of going to moving us on to the debate between intentionalism and functionalism. You had said that the way that the Nazi government was set up, that it was almost counterproductive to give concrete orders. I mean, is, is that because it was, in a sense, this totalitarian state where, you know, the, the intentions, whether directly spoken or unspoken by Hitler, the Fuhrer, uh, essentially overrode or could override any concrete policy decision. Like this gets us right into the intentionalist functionalist debate. And so I'm going to start talking about this. Like intentionalists like, um, I don't know, Karl Dietrich Bracher or Eberhard Jecker will tell you that the Nazi government was set up by, or the Nazi state was set up by Hitler in a very Machiavellian experiment of, you know, having people assigned the same responsibility and therefore having to fight over their power domains and therefore being very effective at fulfilling his policy. While functionalists will basically take the same thing, which is that there are constant, the con there is the constant creation of new agencies and there is the constant um, enroachment of uh, certain agencies, especially the SS, on the territory of other people's, like of other agencies, like for example, the SS will, is taking over the police or the SS is getting into um, the ec like uh, certain economic um, responsibilities of the, the economics ministry because they start getting involved in forced labor. So basically the way the whole state works is that there's people who have the same responsibility and who will work very um, with very much vigor in fulfilling that responsibility better than the other people who are charged with the same thing um, are doing and so this is like this is the whole crux or this is the whole central stage of the functionalist argument that this whole system was not set up intentionally, but developed because of the specific ideology and the specific history of the Nazi state. And that this system in or this structure in the way it interacted with each other led to this cumulative radicalization. While an intentionalist will grant you the same thing, that it worked that way, but will say, well, this was specifically set up by Hitler. Doesn't this in a way come down to the question of, you know, how much... How much effect could one person have, even if they are, you know, the the Führer of Nazi Germany? You know, because Hitler is kind of famous for being uh, a micromanager, at least in in military affairs. But it, uh, in other sources, and I've read about him, it, he can. It seems like he can be very, very hands off and very kind of uh, negligent or oblique in what he wants. Exactly, like the the whole debate can also be, if phrased differently, can be can be revolved around the question like. What kind of dictator is Hitler? Is he is he a strong or a weak dictator? Or to take it even farther and to take it into a sort of meta realm, the whole debate is about which kind of historical narrative you want to tell. And and the choice in these narratives is: do you want to tell a historical nar narrative of of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust that emphasizes? the individual and its individual responsibilities in the person of Hitler, for example, or do you want to tell an, a historical narrative about Nazi Germany and the Holocaust that emphasizes structure? So basically, the whole idea that, you know, we might have an individually an individual acting, 
But that individual is always acting within certain social structures and political structures and therefore is never really free in his choosing or is never really free, completely free in his decision, but will always probably bow to the pressures exerted on him by the structures that surround him. So this is kind of a, a rehashing in a way, at least in a broader sense, of the idea of kind of like the great man theory of history versus kind of more of... I guess you could say more of a, a Marxist kind of interpretation and in the fact that it's, you know, these conflicting groups with the power of history behind them interacting. Exactly. Like the whole, it is no wonder that the debate occurred when it occurred, because at, in, in, in German historical scholarship, that was the time when really there was, you could say, a change of guard or a change of paradigm when you had the older guard, the post world, the immediate post war, World War II guard that emphasized a very political and diplomatic history, historical narrative that focused very much on these topics and very much on like high politics, high diplomacy. And on the other hand, you have people coming from the very Marxist inspired school of, of social history who like to tell history from below and who will for example like Broja does say well it's completely irrelevant what the historical actor states his intention is because if his intention is to go to the moon he can't because the structures won't let him because there is an underlying working of history that drives history in a certain direction now, this is also a very, I guess you could say, a, a very German debate as well, because, I mean, at the heart of this, you know, if you look at it, well, you know, from the, the extreme intentionalist uh, position that we, we talked about earlier, that, you know, Hitler did it all. Hitler had it everything, you know, planned out from the very beginning. It was all Hitler, 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 Hitler. But if you look at it from a very extreme function, uh, functionalist perspective, it was, well, no, we, you know, he was the figurehead, but this was something that kind of grew almost organically from this this state and from German society as well that I mean in, in a way isn't this kind of a discussion and debate about the the culpability of the of of Germans in the Holocaust very much so because every Holocaust debate you're gonna have in Germany in the hist even in historical academia does always carry a very heavy moral implications because it's basically you're still talking about you know why did grandpa murder people and therefore or in the case of these people why did i murder people or why did my father murder people and so there is always a certain <clears throat> question of guilt and moral responsibility that 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 comes uh, that comes with it in terms of the intentionalists will say you know Taking responsibility for the Holocaust away from Hitler and contributing the Holocaust to the structures of a society takes out the most important individual and therefore, you know, kind of reduces the Holocaust to something that is like every other historical process, which for them it is not because they see it as this kind of like this break in civilization, this break in the modern way history works forward towards a better end. And for the structuralists, you know, they say, well, yes, it is like basically any other historical event, and they will have to deal with the fact that people rightly criticize them for what is in fact taking the individual actor and his responsibility out of history. So there is always this question of also how does the historian in general deal with his moral responsibility? Like, is it our respons responsibility as a historian to point out criminals in history and to point out criminal behavior in history and to, to basically um, show it to the world as the abhorrent policy it is? Or is it our, as for the structuralists, or is it our responsibility as the historian to explain what led to this crime and with the same methods we employ for every other historical occurrence like the Napoleonic Wars and so on and so forth? Yeah, in, in a way asking the question of was, was the Holocaust unique in history, which is of course a, a debate that has been held many, many times in many different different ways. 
but more importantly, you know, if it is unique, do we approach it with the same tools and the same kind of uh, academic, dry academic um, pulling apart and parsing of the the elements that we would for anything else, or does it require a, a certain like different tools and a different historical method to actually understand it? Exactly, and and you know, L, and this all is of course doubly influenced that the people who are discussing this are Germans who did not have the most remarkable past in that regard. I mean. Most of the actors in this debate, when it occurred in, in, in the early 80s, are people who have been either in the Hitler Youth or some of them even in the part, like members of the Nazi Party. So, you know, that personal, <laughs> that personal side of the debate also is, is basically contained within um, those theories, because of course, you know, some of these historians who at one point were members of the Nazi party uh, also find it appealing that, you know, we can point to Hitler and explain him as this kind of accident in history that befell us as Germans or Austrians. And, and we can get back to being good Germans. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, I mean... It, it sounds like, of course, that it tied into this was a lot of the emotion of people kind of debating not just their own history in the sense of their own German history, but their own history in the sense of their own life history. Um, now, of course, we are 70 years past the end of World War II. Uh, and presumably, I mean, there's there's not a whole lot of veterans of that conflict left. I mean, how has this debate changed in more in more recent time? Well, with the changing of the generation complete, I think it's fair to say that that basically this debate has been overcome, and there has been like the there was or it ended the debate ended, and it ended with a sort of compromise by people who did a new sort of research into the topic. Like you have people who appear in the late 80s and early 90s when they, you know, finally had access to the Eastern European archives and a lot of new work uh, on the topic could be done. And I think what is the end of the intentionalism-functionalism debate is that there is a sort of mixing of both elements that are seen now as the majority academic consensus of how the decision for the final solution was reached and how the Nazi state worked as a society and as a political beast, basically. So, so this, is, this is kind of a compromise that says, like, well, a, a little bit of intentionalism, a little bit of functionalism. Exactly. Like, for example, you will have um, <clears throat> people like Ian Kershaw will posit that a very important factor in the coming about of the, the, the killings was what he calls working towards the Fuhrer. So that Hitler stated his in, what he wanted in very vague terms, and then people started interpreting these, these vague terms towards a more brutal and more radical policy. That, for example, would be one of the newer theories that came out of this debate and that sort of mixed these, these intentionalistic and functionalistic um, theories because Kershaw will posit that, you know, Hitler wants to murder the Jews and basically at some point says as much. But the how it works actually and how it's implemented is something that his uh, his his the people who are subservient to him do out of their desire to please to please him but at the same time they also have their own uh, kind of individual agency and uh, motivations as to, as to what they want as well you know if you're a, you know upper level bureaucrat in nazi germany you also want to be you know you also want to expand your own personal influence and if by carrying out what you think might please the Fuhrer, yeah, in a way you're carrying out, you know, Hitler's desires, but you're also working towards your own ends as well. 
Exactly. Like uh, one of the examples Kershaw uses is that the, the, the people in Serbia, like the Wehrmacht commander in Serbia, he, despite, you know, the OKV or Hitler not specifically ordering him to shoot the Jews, goes ahead and shoots the Jews. And therefore, he is then able um, later in the beginning of 42, when when other people were there and killed the women and children to state, well, I was the guy who made Serbia free of Jews and who basically accomplished this 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 major feat that the first territory outside of the Soviet Union is completely free of Jews, and that serves his end like that serves his personal agenda very well. Which and, uh, part of what we're kind of working around here is in kind of keeping on more on the the, the dry you know structural emphasis here is that a lot of these people simply were you know incredible anti-Semites. Exactly, like the, the structuralists or the functionalists tend to uh, tend to underplay, from in my personal opinion or from my personal t- taste, t- tend to underplay the role of these people's anti-Semitism a bit too much because you know some of them really did hate Jews very much so and really were rather hell-bent and happy about their role in, in, in being able to murder them. And there are examples of this. Like, mm, we have uh, members of a police battalion in Poland, not the police battalion Browning wrote about, but another one. <clears throat> and as um, uh, Malmann, uh, a German historian, shows in, in, in one of his, his articles, is... Um, they write letters home that they are very, very proud that they're going out there and, 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 and shooting Jews. And they're very happy about that. And they talk to each other about that and, and brag about it, how many people they shot in a day. Well, I, I think this is kind of going to bring us towards an epilogue here, which is looking back on, you know, the, the Holocaust through this lens of this intentionalism versus functionalism debate and how it's evolved uh, into the kind of the more modern academic sense. You know, what can we learn from looking back on history through these lenses? And and I guess more in particular, I can say, what does this tell us about individual agency uh, in historical events? Well, I think the, the, the whole debate really goes to the point or speaks to a point uh, that, that is relevant for every historian and everybody in, in the historical profession, professions that you will have to think about the, the topic of what agency does an actor have, how much do structures uh, influence him in, in his decisions and really gets us to some of the most pertinent questions that we have to ask ourselves in in our everyday kind of work that it's really difficult to to get into the actor's mind and determine why the actors did act the way they acted sorry for rambling on here but i think that's that's really the point that we see in this debate in a very very extreme and and also um um in in this case like morally charged way but it really um gets us gets us thinking or at least it got me thinking about about these very crucial questions we always have to ask ourselves even before we put our questions our academic questions to the past we have to reflect first on what kind of narrative we think is the convincing one of the past because if we if we believe in a more actor centered version of the past we're going to ask different questions than if we uh, f- uh, focus on structures well joe i want to thank you for laying out some ways of looking at narratives in the past uh, and thank you for being a guest on the podcast well thank you for having me it's it's been an honor and as always thank you all for listening and thank you for your wonderful comments uh, and questions and just general follow-up uh, stuff that happens in discussion posts. Uh, it really is quite wonderful to see the, our guests kind of having a chance to follow up 
on some of the topics that they talk about on the on the podcast. Because really, uh, although it, it may seem interminable for a few, I would guess, uh, an hour is uh, way too short to cover some of these topics, particularly uh, this topic that we've had today. So hopefully you all uh, go by to uh, the discussion post that we'll have up on Ask Historians uh, and follow up with those. That's, of course, www.reddit.com forward slash r uh, forward slash ask historians yes i know where where to ask questions uh so please feel free to go there uh and ask any follow-up questions you might have or we'll have some sources up for further reading as well in the meantime uh, i hope my opening comments about this being really a debate over not so much the the logistics of development although certainly we talked about that but almost looking back on the moral culpability of people and uh, the, this question of, of human agency and who can be really seen as responsible for the Holocaust, or even, or if even anyone can be called responsible for the Holocaust. So I, I hope you could see how this would be a very fraught debate for people who had either lived through it or who had, you know, immediate relatives lived through it. And also you can see how it kind of just fizzled out. It, you know, we don't have this huge stunning conclusion where one side was conclusively proved wrong. We just kind of had this you know, as, as people grew older and as those who, you know, the, the wounds were very raw, uh, those wounds healed over and uh, the light of history shone down and we just had this kind of compromise position that said, well, you know, there, there are good arguments on both sides. And sometimes with historical or even just kind of general academic debates, that, that's what needs to happen is that people who are entrenched on one side uh, need to mellow over time uh, or perhaps a new generation needs to come along. But since we're getting into kind of Logan's run territory here, let's move on and talk about the next couple topics that'll be coming on the podcast. So coming up in uh, two weeks, the next fortnight, we'll be talking to Yara Poma, and we'll be talking about a German colonial venture in uh, 16th century Venezuela, which, I mean, even I, as someone who studies, you know, colonial uh, Americas, particularly kind of Caribbean, Northern South America, Southern North America, I had no idea about this. It was very interesting for me to learn about that. Uh, and then the episode after that, we'll be keeping with our Caribbean theme, but jumping ahead a few centuries. And we were talking with Souser about uh, the end of British Caribbean slavery. So hope you'll come back and join us for both of those. In the meantime, thank you again to all of our supporters on Patreon. That is uh, patreon.com forward slash uh, Ask Historians. So please feel free to go by and help donate and contribute and uh, keep the Ask Historians podcast running and also help us you know, get out these, these wonderful gifts that we're going to start giving out to our contributors as fast as we possibly can. And of course, as long as you're out browsing the internet and doing things, uh, please rate and review us on whatever you happen to be rating and reviewing things on. iTunes works great because so many people get things from iTunes, but uh, other whatever other service you might be getting things through, please, uh, you know, just even if you just want to, you know, rate us five stars, whatever, that's great. But it really helps if you also just leave a comment because that kind of bumps us up in the what's happening new queue and gets uh, more eyes on the podcast. And therefore, you have more people you can talk to about the Holocaust. Because if there's anything people love talking about, it's the Holocaust. Go ahead, strike a conversation with people. They love talking about it. Anyways, in two weeks, we'll be back with a much cheerier and happier uh, conversation about German conquistadors and the settlement of and colonization of the Americas, which involves no tragedy whatsoever. See you in two weeks.